Hello and welcome to this uh, talk for the online uh, distilling conference. It is Barrel Love, the care and maintenance of barrels with the one and only Julian Ornai. Hello. Hello. Julian. <laughs> So um, we, we always do uh, lots of barrel related um, topics with you. You've got your great um, starting a cask management um, class that we've done a couple of times. Um, but now we're going to look a little bit deeper and look into how to look after these barrels. I mean, they are an investment. They're part of your equipment, but they are also, you know, containing some very valuable liquid that you've probably spent quite a lot of time on. Um, so let's get a little bit into um, the care and the management and the maintenance of the barrels. Um, is there any sort of initial thoughts that you have before we really get into it? Um, no, but um, actually I uh, very much love the title of this talk today, Barrel Love, and this is exactly what it is. Uh, I think you can only be successful if you love your barrels. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> I think you got that idea from one of our former talks, um, because I'm always very enthusiastic about barrels. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's where the best talks come from, I think, is, you know, it's, it's an organic kind of process. Okay, well, let's start off. So you are looking for somewhere to get your barrels, and you could be making a whole host of things, whiskies or brandies or gins that you want to mature. What's the starting point to find good quality barrels because I imagine you know if you the, the most important thing is to get quality to start with that's going to help manage the barrels and keep the quality there. Well first thing is you need to um, think about if you would like to buy some barrels which had just been built meaning absolutely fresh never had a filling beforehand or if you buy from a barrel broker who um, just sells used barrels so that's the first big difference because if you are looking for new barrels you might work together with a local cooperage uh, that maybe uh, offers you exactly the type of wood and the type of um, toasting or charring or so would you would you really want it very much depends on which country you're in uh, there is no general uh, idea about that or, or, or solution about where you can buy your barrels. Unfortunately not, because um, the business is so different uh, from country to country. And, uh, but actually what, what is the most important for, uh, you have to work with people you trust. And this um, is nothing uh, like a short-term relationship. It's very long, it should be very long-term. And therefore you should very seriously think about uh, whom you're working with. Mm, great. So let's maybe let's take a couple of examples um, and then like as almost as a case study and you can talk us through some thoughts. So I'll give you a couple of scenarios. So the first one is um, I'm using a totally fresh barrel. It might be American oak, might be French oak, but it's virgin, never had anything in it before. It's a number three char or something like that. What do I need to do when this barrel arrives? It's arrived, it looks like it's is it in good condition? How do I check? What should I look for? And then what do I need to do before I put my spirit in it? Yeah, so um, mostly nowadays when you order a new barrel, you get it on pallets. They are all uh, um, wrapped in plastic and, and they are secured to each other if they bump at each other that uh, there's no damage to it. So um, yeah. Uh, if the palette looks like a mess, you uh, can get an, you have an idea what's, what's inside, but if the palette looks good. So um, the first thing is that you try to make your mind, um, you unwrap everything and you have a first smell. Um, I know that most of the cooperages nowadays secure the barrels with that uh, plastic stoppers uh, that, um, and I'm not a big fan of that. So first of all, you should find out what kind of other stopper you get for it. Then you just nose it. And the thing is with very fresh barrels is that you um, should uh, remove all the dust that is inside. And this is something you cannot avoid uh, when you have a fresh barrel, you're gonna have a lot of sawdust inside. So that means uh, you fill it with maybe 10 liters of warm water, just warm water, and you just roll it around a little bit that the water really reaches each corner of the, of the barrel and then you empty it. 
quite quickly. I wouldn't allow the water to stand inside for a very long time because um, the warm water reacts very well with the, with the wood. And that means um, that you also take out some tannins and you might like to have these tannins. It very much depends on. If you would like to take away the first load of intense tannins, you can leave the water inside for a day or so. But if you uh, like for uh, a new American white oak, where you really want to have this uh, vanilla caramel thing you don't want to remove too many uh, tannins directly from the beginning therefore you just rinse inside with warm water and and roll it and then you uh, 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 um, you drain the water out and that's it yes great and then you mentioned about the um the bungs in the top you said you weren't a big um fan of the plastic um could you tell us why and also what the alternatives are. Are you looking for something like a, a rubber bung or something like that? <laughs> yeah, the, the rubber bung. <laughs> I can't roll the R as nice as you. No, this is exactly what I'm not going to look for. Um, I actually like um, the wooden bungs uh, that are made from poplar, poplar wood and uh, because uh, they really fit well into oak cask and I, I imagine that you are that we're talking mostly about oak casks now um, and if you sec secure them with a little cloth so it's perfectly uh, dense and um, and it allows the the wood to still work um, because depending on the temperature the the wood uh, shrinks and expands and and that's the reason why I'm not a big fan of these rubber bongs um, because if uh, if you would like to take them out on a very warm day when the when the wood expands and also the the plastic and, and this is what it is plastic expands and you get it out it can happen that um, the stave exactly where you have this bung hole exactly breaks and and therefore I'm not a big fan of these and um, so I always like to go for the natural material. Good, excellent advice there. Um, fun to say, but not very necessarily so useful for uh, <laughs> the utility of uh, stopping up your barrel. Um, so that was one example. So let's take, um, let's say that you've got something that's already had um, something in it beforehand. So it's a sort of second or a third use. So let's say we had um, an ex bourbon cask and uh, an ex sherry cask, let's, for example. Mm -hmm. um... Um, I would uh, stay away from any rinsing with these casks. Usually they are, uh, when, when we're talking about ex-wine barrels and sherry port and all these sweet wines, uh, they belong to these ex-wine uh, uh, barrels. Um, actually, they should have a little liquid in the barrel. They should not be uh, shipped totally dry. So um, you should have at least uh, one or two liters of the remain remaining liquid in it. And this is something I would uh, uh, just disgorge and, and taste it and smell and taste the liquid. Um, also, of course, smelling the cask, I, I always do that. That's the first thing to, to be honest, but also uh, getting an idea of the liquid. And the liquid is something I know that uh, some companies just work with transport liquid. Uh, that's not the nice thing. Actually, I would prefer to have the, the original liquid in it, but you never know exactly if you get that. And um, um, uh, smelling and tasting that gives me an idea of the condition of the cask. It gives me an idea of how active the cask is, if there's still a lot of tannins in it, or it may be already very old and had been used for many times. And, um, and uh, um, yeah, this is the first thing to, to make myself familiar with the cask and getting an idea of what kind of liquid should go in it, how long, uh, what should be the condition for aging and all this stuff. Uh, with ex bourbon barrels, unfortunately, it's different. They are mostly shipped totally dry, and this is sometimes really a problem because um, um, if they are have been on in a container and on a ship for for weeks or even months, um, they might uh, tend to leak a little bit and. Um, 
And but there are a few tricks that you can uh, avoid the leaking or uh, prepare the cask for the first filling, definitely. Yeah. Mm. And I think this is probably something we're talking about now. Yeah, that'd be great. If you can carry on with that now, yeah, these little <laughs> tips for preparation, that'd be perfect. So uh, I know that there are a few theories uh, out there, and as you can imagine, I have my own. And, uh, <laughs> and well, um, as I just, just mentioned, I would stay away from uh, rinsing the cask from the inside because you really would like to get some of the taste of the former filling and uh, you don't want to wash that out too much. And therefore, um, what I usually do is that I um, put the cask upright and you have that little edge around the cask and if you fill that top of the cask until, uh, until it is uh, totally filled up uh, to the edge, um, and you leave that, allow the water to soak in maybe overnight. The next morning, just flip it over, do the same thing on the other side. And in the evening again, flip it over and just, if you do that for three to five days, um, the water can soak in uh, on the staves from, from uh, the side. And that allows the wood to swell up and that makes it dense again. And you don't have the problem that you, that you uh, fill it from the inside for the staves to either control, of course, if, if, they, if the cask is dense, I know this is a problem, you, you should not do it. You should trust uh, uh, your feeling, of course. But on the other hand, it really helps you to, to allow the, the staves to swell up and, um, and therefore the cask should be dense afterwards. Mm, good and um, I, would, I would never use cold water again. Um, and neither hot water it should be lukewarm okay because the the wood reacts much better with warm water than with cold or hot excellent thank you very much um with just back to the some of the um wine casks is there much of a problem sometimes with like them being treated like sulfur and things like that beforehand yeah well one of my favorite topics <laughs> And that's the reason why the first thing I do when I get such a truckload of, of casks into one of the distilleries I'm working for, um, I, I smell. And uh, if a cask is heavily sulfured, you can easily smell that. Uh, that's a reason for myself not to accept that kind of cask. So I would send it back directly, I must say, because I hate it when wine casks are sulfured. And um, unfortunately, that's a big thing nowadays. I think most of the casks, particularly wine casks, have been sulfured uh, nowadays because um, you. Uh, this is the way how they try to secure that the cask arrives quite fresh on your yard, in your yard, and 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 that's and that's for me a big problem because the sulfur is something you cannot get rid of. No matter how often you fill that cask, you cannot get rid of. I know that some people try to work with washing the cask out, but you wash anything else. But you want you definitely wash out is the sulfur. Uh, others uh, work with some citrus uh, uh, liquid um, to and try to wash out uh, sulfur. And actually, I have I haven't found something yet that helps apart from rejuvenating the barrel. That means to to shave off the um, the um, the layers uh, which the sulfur's in, but that's a totally different cask because this is what we call either a neo cask or an, an um, a shave toast with charcoal STR. And that's a much more involved process. You need a cooper for doing that kind of thing. And... Definitely, you can't do it yourself. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. Oh, that's that's that, that's very helpful. So, and I guess that's part of what you said at the beginning, which is the relationship with your barrel merchant or whoever's supplying your barrels they'll know oh it's going to jewels no sulfur in there <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> good no. okay so we've got I our think, so, yeah please yeah i think if you have a long-term relationship and you tell your your uh, uh cast dealer what you really want and then you should also get what you want okay and um 
I always find it quite interesting if you order a sherry cask and you get uh, some red wine cask from Italy, or if you order an ex bourbon barrel and you get something that might have had bourbon whiskey in it for a week or so, but you can see that the cask is fairly new. And, and these, these are all the things. So uh, if you order something, your, your cask dealer, your barrel broker, whatever you call it, should know exactly what you want and you should not accept anything else and and only fill the cask that you that fit into your barrel program and, and that's a that's the big thing so um each distillery should have a kind of an aging program and should know exactly what the flavors are they are looking for and if you just get any casks by by chance you can never ever fulfill this particular program and therefore you should only accept uh, uh, what you've ordered mm. okay so we've got our barrel we've got we've put our liquid in it we're leaving it there let's say for argument's sake we're going to leave it for a couple of years three years for argument's sake what should i be looking for um during the time that the liquid the spirit is in there maturing just to make sure that things are going okay for the barrel and everything. And also, where should I put it in my distillery? Assuming I don't have a whole big rack house myself just to put all the barrels in, I don't have that much space. What's an appropriate place to keep it? What isn't an appropriate place to keep it? Mm -hmm. um, so one thing is, as soon as you have filled the cask, you should not move it uh, around because uh, that's not uh, a really good thing for a filled cask. The, the uh, possibility of any uh, damage is too high. Therefore, you should make your decision about the place where the cask should be and where it should age for the coming years. You should make this decision beforehand. And if you realize later that you should move it from one place to another, you should uh, pump it empty and uh, move it and uh, then fill it again, um, just to be on the safe side. Um, I know that in former times, people have moved around all these filled casks. And um, actually, um, uh, I, I, um, I'm always a little bit... Uh, uh, I keep my mouth open and can't believe what I see in all the movies, you know, but actually I wouldn't do it. It's too dangerous. It's too dangerous for the cask. It's too dangerous for the people being around and might being hurt. Um, so uh, therefore don't move it. So um, in terms of the place where you hold it, um, be careful with old um, barrel racks that they uh, make sure that they are good enough that they can keep the way of the cask and uh, because um, if you have older um, older um, um, wax for for storage uh, please make sure that they don't rust or something and that nothing is gonna break uh, always uh, go for new stuff just in in terms of safety and uh, yeah so um, uh, if you would like to uh, leave your barrel for long term you should not leave it directly under the roof where it's super hot because that doesn't mean long term uh, you, uh, the aging in such environment is much quicker and therefore you should definitely uh, um, plan for long term maturation somewhere close to the ground where the the humidity is high and where the temperature is more steady and um yeah, depending on uh, what kind of warehouse you have, uh, it's difficult to say because there are so many possibilities outside. Um, anyhow, I always prefer something with a steady temperature and a middle high humidity, but but more high than, than low humidity. But you cannot, uh, it, depending on where you are on Earth, it's not always possible. Mm. But you need to have it somewhere that, you know, is not going to be exposed too much to the weather to the elements you don't want to just keep it in an old garage somewhere or something that's leaking <laughs> 
I think most of the uh, uh, most of the authorities won't allow that anyhow because uh, I I realized that um, all these regulations uh, are getting more and more strict that you have to secure your casks very safely and um, and therefore a garage is probably not the right <laughs> probably not the right place no definitely not <laughs> okay so. We've got our spirit that's been in the barrel, let's say three years. We've taken it out. We then, because that's the, we're going to bottle it. We're happy. We're going to proof it. That's a different talk, but we're going to do all that. We've got this barrel and we want to reuse it. What, what do we need to do? I mean, let's say that we were making whiskey, for example. What would we do subsequently? Um, I think it's part of the barrel uh, uh, management that you don't allow the barrels to stand around maybe in your yard for a very long time and not being filled. So um, when you empty a cask, you should refill it. Uh, if you would like to further use it, um, you should refill it quite quickly. After that, uh, you should not leave it empty for longer, maybe than a week or so. Um, I know it sometimes it's not possible, but if you have to store it, uh, put the bong in and leave it in a cold, humid uh, area um, to, to, uh, um, for, for the storage for a while, um, mostly it's about the same um, um, kind of climate where you uh, have the, the aging uh, and your warehouse and um, but anyhow you should uh, you should empty or you sh uh, so, sorry you should put the bung in that's really uh, important uh, that you don't allow any little animals or any dust or whatever inside and also keeps you away from any bacteria inside. Um, when you um, want to refill it, uh, just lay it down um, on the place where you where you would like to uh, leave it for the for the uh, maturation time and allow the bung open for maybe a few hours that uh, air can go in and can and can uh, develop inside a little bit, uh, but but that's it. Um, there's not much you really need to uh, to follow. Um, that's the easiest thing. Just be careful with your cask and just love your cask. <laughs> and then, is there anything um, during the period that it's mat maturing? So, like even in that first three years, is there anything? To to keep an eye out for that might be an indication of some sort of problem, some problem with the cast, some problem with the spirit when you're looking at it? Well, uh, you should have an eye on them, of course, but uh, maturation is usually a long term thing, so it's not necessary to have a look each day. And uh, what is really important that you don't take samples too often, because usually you have inside, you have above, because you always have a, a kind of an air cushion on top of the liquid. And uh, that cushion uh, gets uh, heavily uh, uh, alcoholic with the time. And as soon as you take the bung out, it disappears. And then you allow the spirit uh, a huge surface of oxidation. And if you do that too often, so the oxidation uh, works a little bit too much. Therefore, it does not make sense to, bong, to, to open the bong each day and say, hello, how are you? Uh, really does not make sense. So um, I understand that it is necessary to take samples from time to time. And I would, do, I would take the first sample uh, for, from a long-term product after maybe the first, first three months of, of maturation. Just um, if, this is be, if this has been a barrel that had been used for many times already, uh, it makes sense to see how far has the maturation gone after three months. And I think that's a very good point to make your mind. You can see, oh, is there already some color? Is there already some taste? And then, you know, okay, there's not much color. There's not much taste. I can leave it for three years, you know? 
why taking samples in the meantime? It's not necessary. Yeah. But um, if you are working with totally fresh casks, it could happen that if the environment is a little warm and not too humid, and you have a lot of flexibility of, of temperature, it could happen that uh, your spirit had taken on always after a month so much tannins and so much color and so much flavor that you don't want to leave your cask for three years untouched. And therefore, um, with a totally new cask, I would actually take a few samples in the very beginning because it, uh, it could happen that after a month you already, or maybe two months or so, that you already have the feeling that's too much of tannins now. I can't leave it for three years. I might take it out, uh, uh, pump my, my liquid into an older cask that had already been used for five or six years or, or for five or six times or whatever, and use that barrel that had been totally fresh and just had been used for one or two months, uh, use it for either uh, finish again or use it for fresh liquid again. But then I, if I had used it only for one month, then I need to check it after two, uh, after with the second, with the second uh, filling, because um, it might already be enough for them. It very much depends on. With American white oak, it's mostly not, not that big problem, but with French oak, holla, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would be super careful. <laughs> Good. And it also has to do with the size of the barrel. You know, if you if we are talking about uh, uh, 200 liters, 225 liters or so, it's not that quick. But if we're talking about smaller barrels, one month can be more than enough. And then you definitely need to pump the liquid to another barrel. Otherwise, you might damage it. That's part of the barrel management, which we had already talked about uh, um, in other talks. And I think with the last Craft Distilling Expo, we talked about uh, the barrel management. Yep. Our special workshop, online workshop. Yeah. And we're doing yes. another one this year. Yeah. And uh, um, I think that's, that's a to total different topic. It's nothing I can describe in five, month, five no, minutes. No, so. of course. Yeah. Of course. Mm -hmm. So we've got that. We've used the we've used the barrels they've been used more than once i mean how long is it um feasible to reuse a barrel how many times can you use a barrel and then how do you know when it's time to say goodbye to the barrel and what do you do with it then well um uh, I've heard from, from a cooper, which I honor very highly, he said uh, that you usually a European oak cask um, can be used for 150 years if you do it right. And an American white oak cask can easily be used for 80 years or 100 years if you do it right. And I think this doing it right is the big problem. And, um, and that's also part of the barrel management, which I cannot describe in five minutes. But, but anyhow, um, if you have uh, used uh, a cask with high alcohol, uh, um, with very high alcohol levels, when we're talking about something about 60 ABV, and you, you increase the strength with each filling, and this is what you should do, you might start with 52, and then you increase slowly, and you come to that area when you use the cask with something at 60 ABV, 62, 63, maybe even 65 or so. That means a cask is quite exhausted then. And, in, and if you would like to use it for another time, maybe a seventh time, an eighth time or so, it might not offer you very much flavor and color anymore. Um, this is the time when actually I would just keep the cask in my in my barrel family, and this is where the big love comes from because it's part of my it's part of my distillery. It had been used with my personal distillate that has my special taste for so many times, and then I would just use it as a kind of a, a, a storage vessel and uh, to allow maybe a whiskey or a rum to age for many, many years and just getting in some oxidation, but no more taste and no more color. Uh, because you, the, the whiskey or the rum or brandy or so might have had and might have got that kind of flavors and, and colors for more active casks already. 
but then you use it just as a storage vessel and you allow your whiskey or your rum to age there for 10 years, 20 years, whatever. And, um, and you should always have a huge number of that kind of storage casks in your warehouse in uh, contrast to the younger one. And actually I found it so strange if people buy a barrel, use it once, and then throw it away. Uh, <laughs> that's not the kind of barrel of I understand. <laughs> yeah. You're there for the long term. It's a, a decades mm -hmm. old romance. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, maybe after uh, 80 years, 100 years or so, the cask uh, is not dense anymore and and then you can you can see that uh, if it doesn't hold the liquid anymore and it does not make really sense to to repair it hmm. you need to say goodbye yeah it's like elderly people at one point you have to say goodbye to them yeah so um you mentioned about the uh the repair aspect of things um mm -hmm. and obviously you've got the cooper's when you can find them, you know, because they're not available everywhere. Um, and they are, you know, they're the experts in there. But in terms of doing some of these fixes themselves, I know, like you said about when the, if a stave breaks, when the bung comes out, there's not much that most distillers can do about that, is there? No, that, that's the moment when you, uh, uh, when the, 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 the stave is not broken totally, you might be able to have this cast because it is, it is lying here, you know, and this is the top bung, so you, uh, you won't have a big problem uh, with it. You might be able to use it for, for a while anymore, but as soon as you have any uh, stave broken you need to uh, give it to a cooper because we are all not trained coopers and that's a that's a, a thing that only a, a cooper can can help you with uh, there are a few things you can do your own maybe uh, if you have uh, a little breakage that you will help yourself with little wooden sticks that you can press in or uh, you might have the possibility to if you have uh, an area where it leaks a little bit that you can help yourself with this oh, i don't know the name in the english name of that uh, of that uh, filling material which is very thin and which uh, um, looks like um, like a hay uh, a part of uh, of a straw or so which you can put in mm. and um, sometimes you can help yourself with just a dough made of flour and water and uh, and uh, fix um, a point but if you really have a leakage you should bring it back to cooperage and I uh, hope for you that you have some something like a cooperage nearby because in some countries it's really a problem because they don't have that long history of cooperage just like we have here in Germany where you have uh, still have a cooper in each other village mm. for, in, in, particularly in wine areas yeah. yeah I was I was speaking to a um stiller in South America um who there's no Cooper. They're like there's just there is no one near him. So um he's taken it upon himself to learn how to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he couldn't get the tools either. So he's had to make the tools himself as well. So it'll be very interesting. <laughs> um when he's oh done a bit more of it, we should get him on for a talk. I think it would be quite a fascinating discussion <laughs> to see the approach that he's taken to that. Um but yeah, for most people, not not a practical solution. His is largely he wants to do aged spirits it's driven by necessity he can't get the stuff so he has to do it um yeah that is that's absolutely uh, superb any other sort of general thoughts on barrel love or anything like that the loving the barrel <laughs> yeah well um that's also part of the barrel management but i just would like to uh, point out that each stress uh is not good for the barrel and stress like it is stress for the liquid inside uh, but for the barrel the stress is a variation of temperature so if you have extreme temperature swings that's not really good for the barrels and definitely limits the life of a barrel and also extremes uh, swings in humidity uh, so if you are able to um, um, if you are able to to avoid these that's very important 
Um, I once have seen a distillery and I've, I've given that, that advice already to a few of my clients and they have installed it as well. And I absolutely love that idea. Uh, they have installed small uh, um, pools in their warehouse with, with little fountains, you know, uh, just... Uh, <laughs> like a water <laughs> so, feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it, it's just a lovely thing that um, because if the water runs over stones, you know, you have always a, a kind of a natural humidity uh, in a warehouse, a little fountain, you know, just uh, something that that uh, allows water to spray. And that means that you have a natural hum humidity in your warehouse. And that's just an amazing thing for barrels that keeps them alive for a very long time. So as much as we need to drink, a barrel needs some humidity as well. Please just uh, consider it as, as an, a natural thing that is still kind of alive. I know that it's not a tree anymore, but it has a second life. And this is the kind of love if you allow this natural material to, to breathe and to, to uh, get humidity and all this, uh, just to make it, um, to make the life of that, uh, of that material more relaxed. And uh, this is my advice. <laughs> Brilliant. And I think that is the perfect note to end on. So Julia, <laughs> it is a pleasure as always to have you. Thank you for spending so much time and giving us so much of your knowledge. Thank you to everybody for watching. There will be a, a live Q&A session. Probably we can talk more generally about barrels um, when we're in April. And uh, we shall speak to you soon. All the best, everyone. Bye. And I'm looking forward to see you all online again. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>